examinations. These include first degree, second degree or Mobitz type 1, also known as Wankybach, second degree or Mobitz type 2, as well as third degree heart block. Without further ado, let's delve into our first condition, which is first degree heart block. Most commonly, our patients with first degree heart block are going to be asymptomatic. These patients may be generally healthy or may have other comorbidities, including heart disease. Therefore, while those who have first degree heart block alone tend to be asymptomatic, those who have other comorbid heart diseases may present with syncope, angina, heart failure, or even AFib. In addition, these patients may classically present with what is known as pacemaker syndrome. This occurs when the atria and the ventricles are not contracting in a synchronized fashion, and therefore these patients will feel their atria contracting against a closed mitral valve. Normally, when the atria is contracting and moving blood from the atria into the ventricle, the mitral valve is going to open up at this point, allowing blood to pass through. However, if the atria and ventricles are not coordinated in terms of their contractions, as we see in first degree heart block, then ultimately the patient may feel that their atria is contracting while this mitral valve is actually closed. And this is classically known as pacemaker syndrome in our patients with first degree heart block. The pathophysiology of first degree heart block is slowed conduction, particularly through the atrioventricular node. Hence this lack of concordance between the atria and the ventricles in terms of their contractions. First degree heart block can be physiologic as we often see in athletes, these athletes have extremely high vagal tone at baseline, and as we know, stimulation of the vagus nerve is going to lead to slowed conduction through the AV node. This is why you will see in a lot of competitive athletes that they often have a very slow resting heart rate as a result of this high vagal stimulation of the AV node. Additional etiologies of first degree heart block include ischemic disease, cardiomyopathy, as well as iatrogenic causes as many medications actually slow conduction through the AV node. These medications include beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and digoxin. In first degree heart block, our patients are going to have a PR interval on their EKG that is greater than 0.2 seconds. This PR interval is going to stay the same. There's not going to be prolongation progressively, for example, as we move along the EKG. Additionally, these patients may have a normal QRS or a YQRS defined as a QRS that is greater than 120 milliseconds. Therefore, all that we are really going to see on the EKG is that the patient has a PR interval that is greater than 0.2 seconds. This represents being greater than one box in terms of width. So if we, for example, were to take a look down at the bottom here at lead two, and we were to demarcate here this PR interval, we can see that it is a little bit longer than we would normally expect to see. For example, this one starting around here, and then ending up around here. This appears to be a bit over 0.2 seconds, and therefore this is consistent with a prolonged PR interval greater than 0.2 seconds, which is characteristic of first degree heart block. And really this prolongation of the PR interval should make sense to us in terms of the pathophysiology of this condition as the PR interval essentially represents the conduction from the atria to the ventricles. And if these patients have slowing of that conduction, then it should not be surprising to us that they will have a prolongation of their PR interval. In terms of management, as we stated previously, patients may have a normal QRS in the setting of first degree heart block, or they can have a prolonged QRS that is defined as being greater than 120 milliseconds. For our patients with first degree heart block who simply have this prolonged PR interval and they have a normal QRS, we can simply observe these patients as they're often going to be asymptomatic. However, if our patient has a wide QRS, which is once again greater than 120 milliseconds, then we should ultimately proceed with EP testing as these patients need to be further evaluated. However, these are really the case for our asymptomatic patients, as if our patients are symptomatic or they have the pacemaker syndrome where they can feel their atria pushing up against that closed mitral valve, then ultimately these patients may need a pacemaker. A pacemaker, as evident in its name, is going to send electrical impulses that pace the heart for our patients who have slow or abnormal rhythms. You may also see mention of single lead and double lead pacemakers. A single lead pacemaker, as we can see here on the right, places a single electrode in the right ventricle, whereas our double lead pacemaker is going to place electrodes in both the right atrium and the right ventricle.